And then, so our goal for today um, is, is really, you know, we're, we're looking at a high level just to, to kind of get a general understanding of, of what tax proposals are out there, um, and particularly what kind of the more significant proposals. Um, there's a lot that's in the, the Build Back Better bill that um, that we're going to talk about, um, and we're not going to get into all the details of everything, um, and, and we're not going to get into too much um, depth on anything at all, really. Uh, the reason for that, we don't know um, what's going to pass, whether this is going to pass. Uh, it probably won't be in the form it's in. If it does, so I think uh, it would probably not be time well spent to try to get into the to the details of, um, say, your changes to guilty rules and stuff like that. Um, you may think that that's because I don't really know what guilty is to begin with, and, and I won't say that you're not necessarily wrong if you do think that, but um, that's my cover at least. Um, another little caveat, I mean, it's kind of hard not to be cynical about this stuff, so I may not even try. I may just kind of be cynical. Um, it's also not, it's hard not to get into politics at least a little bit. Um, I'm going to avoid that too as best I can, but but if I do kind of slip, just know that um, any opinions are my own. Um, my, my partners and, and I, the rest of our team uh, are certainly entitled to be wrong if they disagree with me. So getting started first. Um, back during the spring, uh, the Biden administration released uh, the American Jobs Plan, the American Families Plan, and those um, had a lot of tax provisions that kind of laid out what the administration's goals were as far as new tax rules. Um, some parts of the um, of the Families Plan in particular passed as part of the infrastructure bill. Um, there are some that were included in the in the Build Back Better bill that's still, um, that's still hanging out there, uh, and there were some that didn't make it into either one of those. So um, we'll follow up on that a little bit later toward the end of the presentation. The focus today, though, uh, will be on what we actually have as far as um, legislation that's in Congress. We'll talk about the Build Back Better bill um, and some of what's included in that. So just briefly, um, this bill passed the House back in November. Uh, it has not been voted on yet in the Senate. What I still read is that Senator Schumer would like to vote on the, the bill before Christmas, but that um, Senators Manchin and Cinema are still um, are still holdouts. And so where that leaves us, I think, is um, will it pass? I don't think we know. Um, I think it's probably a safe bet to say it won't pass as it is um, right now in, in its house form. But um, what tweaks happen in the Senate that might that might make it into a final bill? Um, or where the real question is going to be. So again, we're going to focus on what we know at least, which is what, what's on the bill that passed the that passed the House, uh, broken into a, kind of into a few rough sections. Um, so first, we'll look at some provisions for large corporations and, and some international provisions. Um, first up, th there's a corporate minimum tax that's proposed, and so if you'll recall, it, kind of one of our themes too is that the the, the, the Build Back Better bill kind of takes aim a little bit at the at the TCJA from 2017. I mean, a lot of the changes are things that um, that were there before and now maybe coming back. Um, this is kind of like an alternative minimum tax for, for the corporations that, that went away with the TCJA. Um, now, this would only apply to, 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 to very large corporations. Um, the threshold is a billion dollars of net income. So it's not even it's not even a billion dollars of revenue. It's net income. So um, pretty substantial corporations, but uh, if a corporation is over that, looking at a three-year average, th then there will be this 15% minimum tax that the corporation would be subject to. Another one that applies only to, to large corporations, this is actually only to publicly traded corporations, um, is a 1% tax on the value of stock that the corporation repurchases during the year. Not much need to go into that too much. And as I laid out before, I really don't know what uh, what guilty and FDII mean, um, or at least I know enough to, to know to go ask uh, the ladies who spoke in the session before me if I do have very detailed questions about them. Um, but there are provisions in the in the um, in the in the bill that would address those. Uh, Faye covered those a little bit in the international presentation. Uh, there's also a limitation on interest expense for multinational corporations. And if they also hit on something I missed in this slide, which is um, some, some changes in the foreign tax credit, which are proposed. 
Okay, and then we'll move on to some benefits. These are actually benefits for for um, for lower income taxpayers. Um, and David and Helene stole a bit of this um, in their session this morning, but I'll say I'm maybe going to augment what they talked about um, and, and look more kind of forward with this. Um, so as they mentioned, the the, the child uh, the child tax credit increased to three thousand dollars per child in general, or thirty six hundred dollars per child. Um, in 2020, um, this uh, this bill would make that increase um, permanent. I believe I didn't write that down. Uh, I think it is actually a permanent change um, according to the bill for, for for that provision to increase the amounts of those credits. Um, there is an AGI phase out there, so it only applies for, uh, for married couples filing jointly under $150,000 of AGI or $75,000 for single people or, or people married filing separately. Um, another change is that the credit became refundable, and this the, the bill would make um, that fully refundable going forward. And then the advanced payment of the credit is something that's new in 2021. Um, Again, as David and Helene mentioned, um, since I think either June or July, the IRS has been sending out checks every month uh, to people who qualify for the enhanced child tax credit, uh, subject to those same income limitations above the, the 150 and the and the 75. 100% um, of the credit will be paid through advance payments going forward in 2022. Uh, that's only a 2022 provision, so hopefully that's not something that goes on. Uh, forever, because I think that may be a bit of a pain to track, but 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 it, the bill would have that happen um, next year. Okay, and another that I'm not going to go into much detail on, but uh, I think it was either the CARES Act or one of the acts back in 2020 um, boosted some payments for the earned income tax credit, uh, particularly for um, I think for single people, people for people without children. Um, what uh, what this bill would do is essentially move those those rules changes from 2021 forward into 2022 as well. And then Helene talked about this a little bit as the, the premium tax credit. And this is, um, you, you know, there, there's a subsidy under under the Obamacare rules uh, where you could get um, a, a premium tax credit if your income was below 400% of the poverty level. Um, and again, as Elaine mentioned, that really was a cliff. And so if you were a dollar over that, you had to pay back what could be a pretty substantial credit um, and became a, a nasty surprise for a lot of for a lot of taxpayers. Um, last year, that, that wasn't in place. Um, this bill would extend that through 2025. Okay, and this um, again is kind of a reversal of TCJA a little bit, where where we used to have um, a category of itemized deductions for for uh, non reimbursed employee expenses. Here, here are a couple that would come back under the Build Back Better bill, and actually coming back even better because now rather than being itemized deductions, they're they're above the line deductions. Uh, one's two hundred and fifty dollars for for union dues, and another two fifty for employee uniforms. Um, and I think the union dues is, is again, something that's going to be a theme through these, which is that of constituent service. I mean, um, unions are a pretty, a pretty big uh, booster for, for the Democrats and, and uh, something helping them out a little bit with this uh, is part of what that is. Okay, we'll talk about some credits and related expenses next. And, and David went into um, the first of these, the research credit. Um, in a fair amount of detail with with Dr. Helene in their um, in their meeting this morning. Um, so R and D expenses have been fully deductible up through this year, but but as the law stands now, uh, they're scheduled to be um, the, the schedule is for them to be required to be amortized over five years, starting in 2022. Um, one of the provisions of the of the Build Back Better bill would kick that out, and so that requirement wouldn't come into play until 2026. Uh, and, and then just looking at the R&D credit itself, um, for several years now, for, for early stage companies, they were able to use uh, the R&D credit to offset payroll taxes. Um, that was capped at $250,000. The provisions of this bill would, would bump that from two fifty dollars up to $500,000.
and this is a new credit. So the, the, the others were kind of things that have been there and are just getting tweaked. But um, this would be a credit for, for um, donations to public universities that qualify for for, um, for infrastructure, for, for research infrastructure is the way it's written. Um, I, I didn't look into what qualifies, uh, again, because I think that's probably a little bit premature until something actually gets enacted. But um, you know, kind of interesting. It's part of the general business credit, and you, and you would take this uh, credit rather than take a charitable contribution deduction for the donation to the um, to the university. So I kind of liken it a little bit to um, what we've had for a while with with IRAs, where you can make a qualified contribution deduction or a distribution, I should say. Um, and it's a way of making a contribution to a charitable organization getting a tax benefit for it without actually having to itemize deductions or without having to to claim an itemized deduction. So we'll see if that anything happens with that. I thought this one was interesting. I think it's a little bit of constituent service here as well. Um, helping out the, the journalists among us. Um, it's a credit against Medicare tax paid for news journalists. Um, and as a bonus, it's a refundable credit. So you, you can actually get more back than you pay in tax for this credit. Um, it got me thinking a little bit because I, I know Hanson Weeble, we publish our um, our client bulletins. We publish um, different things for our industry groups throughout the year. I, I need to look into this in a little bit more detail if it passes and see if maybe we can be a, a journalistic organization and maybe it's something out, out of the box that might benefit Hanson Weeble a little bit. Anybody have any questions now? I got our next uh, our next word next, but I'll, I'll pause if anybody has any questions or any comments. Okay, next word is cinema. And moving along. Uh, these are some of the, the provisions of the bill that I think have gotten um, a bit more publicized than maybe some of the other ones we've talked about so far. Um, dealing this section with, with high income uh, taxpayers, um, there is a 5% tax on AGI. And so again, fo focus on that. We're talking about AGI and not taxable income. Um, it, it's on the AGI in excess of $10 million for a married filing joint couple or over $5 million for single or married filing separately. And the same surcharge would apply over $200,000 for fiduciaries. And then on top of that, there, there's another 3% um, tax that's on AGI over 25 million, 12 and a half million or 500,000. And, and so thinking about it, I'm, you, know, you would think it wouldn't hit a lot of people, but really if you, you, know, if, if you have a big sale with a big capital gain in a year, because you're looking at AGI, um, you, you know, I could see it hitting some people at least. Uh, where I really think it could be um, a big deal maybe is in the fiduciary land. I mean, 200,000, I mean, I know the, the, the rates are compressed in general for fiduciaries, but 200,000 seems like a pretty low threshold um, before you hit that. So um, maybe something to look at more in, in that world even than in the, the individual tax world. Okay, and the, the, um, the excess business uh, loss limitation, this is something that was from the TCJA as well. Um, like a lot of those provisions in that law, it was scheduled to expire in 2026. Uh, the bill would make that permanent. And this is a loss where you're limited on, on the amount of, of, um, of business loss that, that an individual can claim on his tax return um, to $500,000 of net loss. Uh, the rest would carry forward as, a, as an operating loss, but um, this, this would make that limitation permanent. This one I think could be a big deal. Uh, the, uh, the, the net investment income tax, and I think uh, Jim actually touched on this in the real estate session uh, earlier this afternoon. Um, the net investment income tax is, is, is the 3.8% tax that came in as part of the Obamacare rules. Um, Historically, it's only applied to, to passive to passive income, so investment income and and investments in, in, in passive businesses that may end up on our tax returns. Um, 
the big change here is it would apply that to active businesses as well. So you say I'm an active participant in an S corporation. In the past, I haven't had to pay the NII tax on, on my um, on my allocated income. This provision would, would, would change that. So I would have that would be subject into the 3.8% tax. Um, and and this is going back months, but to, to the to the um, to the American Families Plan, the American Jobs Plan, for a few clients, I kind of scheduled out what the provisions there would make, what kind of changes those would make to their taxes. Uh, this was one of the bigger ones, actually. Um, you know, one of the ones that made a pretty big difference for people. So it's definitely one to keep an eye on. And I think a couple of people in, in sessions earlier have talked about the SALT cap. Um, you know, as we know, again, this is another TG, TCJA rule uh, where the deduction for state and local income taxes was capped at $10,000. The the build back provisions would increase that from 10,000 to 8,000. A, a little bit of a change, you know, where, where the, the cap before was scheduled to, um, to expire, that's now pushed out um, from 2026 through 2031, and then I think I think I think is interesting here is that um, most of the the effective dates for these rules are um, most are either 2022 or 2023 when they would take effect. But if you notice on this one, it would actually be retroactive. So so that would make um, that eighty thousand dollar cap apply to our 2021 tax returns. Um, and again, kind of on the theme of constituent service, you, you know, you, we have a um, a Senate Majority Leader from New York and a, and a Speaker of the House from California, and so you know their their constituents certainly pay a whole lot of state and local tax, and so um, they're they're taking care of their voters here. Um, I think I see a hand raised here, somebody, but I can't quite tell who it is. Um, does Chris, anybody have a comment? Larry, uh, uh, so I, I guess yeah, the I, I question, guess going back a slide yeah. on the NII, uh, is your is the NII change being driven by the amount of money it'll raise or simply leveling out the playing field where a partnership if it's subject to se income you pay the 3.8 effectively on the whole thing or if it's pal you pay the 3.8 and yet an s corps and then run around it or if i'm in a c corp and i take a salary out then i pay it is it is it simply a way of leveling the playing field or is it being driven by how much money it'll raise. Yeah. I'm not sure it's an either or question. I mean, it could be both. Uh, I, I would, um, <laughs> I, I would expect it probably is both. I mean, I, I think there probably is a piece of revenue generation in it because I, I think it'll make a big difference. Um, but then an issue of, uh, of fairness or at least perceived fairness, I think is, is probably there too. You have thoughts? Yeah, I, yeah. I, Cynical, I think of a lot of it's, you know, how much money a lot of things will raise, but this one does seem to be a little bit of a, a leveling out. I, I think you're right. I think it's both, but, you know, my guess is I haven't seen the, the scoring from, uh, right. you know, from CBO of how much, how much money it's going to raise, but I would think with the S Corps, it would be a fair amount of money. So, right. but, I expect so. But, but again, I, you know, uh, it's not it, it's very easy to get cynical right quick about you know what, what drives legislation uh, particularly you go back to the one about the uh where somebody's you know the journalist and stuff you know what you know can i get a little more favorable press from that or somebody's birthday one of the things this morning if you had somebody was you know 17 years old you get the credit and last year you didn't you know how many congressmen have 17 year olds uh, but i will i will refrain from delving into politics much more. We'll probably be, I'll be happy if we do that, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so moving on, see, I think we, we covered SALT, I think, pretty well. Um, the the provision here for the small business stock, so under Section 1202, I mean, and this is a rule that's been around a long time, um, and it's kind of increased as, as the years have gone by. Um, Depending on when you you're, you acquired your stock, so, so the, the rule essentially works that if you have a qualified stock and it's a C corporation, it's it's typically a, a startup C corporation, um, and you sell that stock, you can eliminate um, the capital gains tax on on your 
at least some portion of your gain. Um, that started out as 50% back when the, the law was enacted, um, went up to 75% at some point. I don't recall the, the, the year, but it's been a while since it, that it's been 100% um, capital gain exclusion. Um, for taxpayers with AGI over $400,000, this bill would, would eliminate that 75% and 100% um, rule. And so we're, everybody would be back, or I should say everybody with the, over that AGI would be back at the 50% um, reduction for self, for, for, I'm sorry, for small business stock. And then there are a few, um, a few retirement plan changes that were part of the part of the rules as well. Um, this one uh, is for for large IRAs. Um, actually, it's, it's large IRAs and large uh, defined contribution plans. Um, I, I was talking to to one of my partners earlier this week, and I, I don't think I know anyone who's got a ten million dollar IRA. Um, I, I may know somebody um, who combining that with defined contribution plans would be over ten million dollars. Um, my partner said he did know somebody who was over that. So, so it you know it could have it could have some effect. Um, the the rule is that if you're over that level, you can't make any new IRA contributions until you get below. And then the way you get below is it's going to require a required minimum distribution um, each year. You're over that. Um, sort of like is the rule now if you're over 72 years old. Um, it is hard to get too hung up on this, though, when you look at the last bullet that it's effective after 1231 of 2028. Um, I don't know how many major tax law changes there will be between now and 2028, but at the rate we're going, it's probably going to be um, six, eight, maybe double digits. Uh, so I'll worry about this one when we get a little bit closer. And then a couple more um, retirement plan changes. Um, and, and these actually, I've had conversations in the past week or two um, with, with clients about these. Um, ones for, uh, for, for for Roth IRA conversions. Um, one of the provisions would eliminate being able to, to, to convert uh, uh, traditional IRA, um, I'd say a non-deductible traditional IRA contribution or an after-tax contribution to an employer's plan into a Roth IRA. And so, um, you know, I think where, where that really hits is that the, the backdoor Roths that, that have become pretty popular, where where someone who has too much income to make a Roth contribution makes a non-deductible um, traditional IRA contribution and then rolls it over immediately. So you effectively get around those rules. Um, th this would put a stop to that. And then the next one um, would eliminate Roth conversions altogether uh, for 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 taxpayers with AGI over 450 for for a married filing joint couple or over 400,000 for a, a single or a married filing separate couple. Um, <laughs> my thoughts here. I mean, you know, the, the the people I've talked to. I mean, some have been thinking about. Um, doing a Roth conversion for a little while. And this is kind of key to, to, I think, try to get it done before the end of this year um, in case something should happen like this. So <laughs> maybe it's kind of a backdoor way for Congress to generate some revenue um, in, in 2021 to maybe have some more some more conversions happen this year and realize some of that gain. Okay, and what I'm calling greenery, but but not uh, not the tree that's in your house. Um, th th there is so many um, green and renewable energy provisions in this bill. Um, we'll touch on some that that may be um, fairly widely applicable, but but not on a lot of detail in some of the others. Um, the, uh, the the non-business energy property credit and and. These next two credits, honestly, I've always kind of had a hard time remembering which one was which, and, and this one in particular, I, I always think it expired last year, but it always seems to be going on for another year. Um, I think it actually would have expired this year, but um, this bill would extend it through 2031. And so this is the credit for um, for windows, roofs, doors, um, that type of thing, like the building envelope, I think they call it. Um, 
for your house. And if you put in energy efficient things, um, you could get a credit. The credit was small before. I mean, it, it was a $500 lifetime credit. Um, this would actually change that to be in a $1,200 annual credit. So um, th th that's a fairly substantial um, expansion of the credit. And then the credit rate goes up from 10% to 30%. And it used to have to be your primary residence where you um, where you added the, the new um, the new improvements, but now that it could be a, a second house as well. So um, it, it's really a pretty substantial improvement and a pretty substantial extension of this credit. And then the next one is the uh, residential energy energy efficient property credit. Uh, this is the one that's kind of more major expenditures. So uh, solar electricity, solar heating, uh, geothermal uh, heating and cooling, wind power um, are, are what this would apply to. Um, it was scheduled to expire in two years, in 2023. This would push that out to 2033. Uh, the rate had been 30% for, for a while since it came into play. Um, I think it was 26% last year. This would um, bump that up to 30% out through 2031. And then the rate would reduce again in those last two years of the credit again. So again, a pretty, pretty significant um, extension of, um, of the REAP credit. A lot of stuff about electric, electric vehicles um, are in the bill. There's an $8,500 credit for new electric vehicles. Um, they have some cost caps there. So um, it's vehicles over, they have to be under $80,000 uh, for, for large vehicles. So trucks, vans, and SUVs and below $55,000 for others. Um, so I mean, it's not a market I've been in before, but, but um, you know, I think the, the I think something like the Teslas and whatnot um, have probably been a bit more than that in the past. So, um, you know, it, it at least is looking at kind of the, the lower cost, if, if $80,000 is a low cost um, vehicles. And then it phases out um, at AGI levels, a half a million dollars for married filing joint and a quarter million dollars for single. Um, there are also credits in the bill for um, for used electric vehicles and for two and three wheeled electric vehicles that, that are a bit less than um, than the $8,500 credit. There's something in there about electric bicycles, which I don't think I knew what one of those was. Um, actually, I still don't, but um, I don't think I heard of that until, um, until I read some of the stuff on the bill. I think this one's a little bit interesting, though. Um, th there's a commercial electric vehicle credit that is 30% um, of the cost of the vehicle for, um, for full electric vehicles or 15% for hybrid vehicles. Um, they're defining commercial as whether it's um, subject to depreciation. Uh, and, you know, the interesting thing to me is that, I mean, that's a pretty substantial credit. So if you look here, um, if you have an $8,500 credit on an $80,000 truck, you know, you're a bit over 10%, but um, you're at either 30% or 15% for the commercial credit. So uh, that, that can be a useful um, a useful credit if it comes into play for for some of our businesses who are looking to invest in, in, uh, in electric fleet. And then there are many, many other uh, provisions that I'm not going to get into too much. Um, Credits for production of, of renewable energy, uh, for alternative fuels. Uh, there, there's um, a lot of building incentives for, for energy efficient property. Um, <laughs> one that caught my eye, just because I've done been doing tax returns for, for a lot of years, is um, I know how we all love dealing with, with master limited partnerships. Um, one of the provisions of the bill would actually let, master, let, let the master limited partnership rules apply to renewable energy and not just um, oil and gas and, and um, kind of hydrocarbon. So so um, I know one of the things we're all looking forward to is, is, is more publicly traded partnerships to work on. And so this bill could uh, could make that happen. And uh, the last kind of section I want to talk about as far as the Build Back Better provisions um, are, are some that are specific to, to um, to the IRS, and I, I think this is kind of interesting as far as what um, priorities go. So the first is um, $2 billion for taxpayer services. 
And uh, for anybody who's tried to call the IRS, um, I will say the last five years, but the last two years in particular, um, and seeing what a nightmare that is, um, I mean, this could certainly be money well spent, I think. Um, probably not as important in their mind as the $5 billion for business system modernization. Um, I'm assuming they're talking about their computer systems there. Um, I will say the next IRS um, official I hear speak who doesn't talk about how they need to upgrade their their computers, I might buy them a cigar because that that is um, that's all you ever hear. So I think that probably is something that um, again could probably be well spent money. There's 27 billion dollars in the bill for operational support. Um, I, I didn't look. I honestly don't know what that means. I, I don't know if that's kind of part of um, part of the, the the computer stuff or or just paying more salaries for people. I, I don't know what that means. But it's 27 billion dollars. So obviously it's worth a lot more than um, than either taking care of taxpayers or or modernization. But then the real kicker is $45 billion for enforcement. Um, and so I think what that probably means is if this passes, we're going to be looking at a lot of brand new auditors. And um, if I could find wood around here, I would knock on it because it, it's been a year or two since I think I've really been involved in an audit. Um, but from the, my colleagues who I've talked to, it's not been a pleasant experience with some of the um, some of the new agents who we've been, uh, who we've been working with. So uh, I don't know. That, that that seems like it could be um, a bigger issue coming up if um, if this passes. And of course, that all goes back to what they the IRS is called the tax gap, which I'm not sure it actually exists, and probably certainly not um, to the extent they say it is. Where where um, th there's so much tax that they could collect if they could just um, harass more of our um, more of our fellow citizens. couple other IRS changes. Um, I thought this was interesting. I, and I, I don't pretend to really know the ins and outs of how the IRS works. Um, but uh, they, they say they're going to re repeal the requirement now that I guess a supervisor has a sign off on um, to give written approval for penalties, um, which my thought, you know, if you're going to hire a whole lot of new people, um, probably train them poorly. It seems like the smart thing to do is, is supervise them less closely too. So uh, <laughs> that that could be a fun thing to look at coming up. Um, Chris, a uh, quick comment on that. I, unfortunately, I think uh, penalties have become not for reforming behavior, but for raising revenue. And this pre-approval seems to be getting in the way of the amount of money they're collecting. So. Uh, I think it, yeah, I'm not sure the purest of purposes are at work here. <laughs> I think that's probably a pretty good assumption. <laughs> and then I think my favorite, maybe this is the last one. Um, I, it's only $15 million. Uh, saying only $15 million is funny, but um, to study a free IRS run direct file system. So um, I don't know if that's good. I don't know if that's bad. I, I'm kind of curious to see. <laughs> what it comes out to be. I'm not entirely sure I want to file my tax return that way, though. Um, I have the good fortune of, of being married to a CPA, so I don't file my own tax return anyway. So um, I think I won't be participating. Okay, one last uh, code word here, um, and that is thanks. And by that, I do mean thank you to everybody um, for suffering through this session and for uh, for your time today um, and enjoying the other sessions that, that we've put on. I really appreciate everybody's um, attention and for sticking with us um, all day long. Uh, I do want to get into a few more provisions before we close up for the day. Um, and th there's a lot that didn't make it into the, into the, um, the Build Back Better bill. Um, I mean, for me, I think it probably is, is a good thing that it didn't make it in. Um, you, you could take the optimistic take that, hey, at least none of this stuff is in it. Uh, or maybe the pessimist looks at it and just says, yet. Uh, <laughs> so I think it is good to take a look at kind of the stuff that's been floated around that's not in this bill, because it may still be something that comes down comes down the road later on. Um, and I guess before I leave the slide, as far as glass half empty, glass half full, I do think that uh, as long as there's whiskey in the glass, you're probably doing okay for yourself one way or the other. So what's not included? 
Uh, the American Families Plan that we talked about um, earlier included a um, an increase in the top individual tax rate to 39.6%, which again is back what it was before the TCJA, um, and it would just bump it back up to there. Uh, the, the initial provision was to um, eliminate the preferential tax rate on, on long-term capital gains, and so rather than 20% as it is now, it will go up to the full 396 um, there was something there. I'm losing track of what um, of what got proposed. There was a 25% kind of compromise, I think, that came in somewhere along the line. Um, but regardless, neither of those um, uh, rate increases is included in the in the Build Back Better bill. Uh, there was also in the Families Plan a limitation on like kind exchanges. Uh, it would have capped the deferral on a like kind exchange at. at um, half a million dollars, um, so that's not included now. It would also have uh, tax carried interest as ordinary income. There's nothing about that that's in the Build Back Better. And there were there were a lot of kind of ideas floated about what to do as far as the state tax goes. Um, one that was in the family's plan was to tax unrealized capital gains at a decedent's death, um, subject to some, to some net worth thresholds. Um, that's not included either, and, and I think those are those are um, to me at least um, things to be to be happy about. Uh, looking at the jobs plan, uh, there weren't quite as many things um, in the jobs plan to, to begin with as were in the the families plan, um, and some of those actually did make it into the infrastructure bill that got passed back earlier in the fall. Um, the 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 main thing that was there that's not in either the the infrastructure bill or the build back bill. Um, it is an increase in corporate taxes, um, so that's going to be, we presume, still 21% rather than 28% uh, as we go forward. And then uh, these weren't part of those other uh, the jobs plan or the, the, the families plan, but um, there was a lot of talk about a wealth tax at some point. And I think I did read that some senator, I don't know, maybe Senator Wyden, maybe um, somebody, um, had proposed a wealth tax. So I think that maybe around someplace. I, I don't really know the likelihood that that'll pass, um, but it's something that's out there. Um, and there were proposals for additional bank disclosures. And so kind of like really beefed up um, 1099 rules essentially. Um, so again, thankfully um, that's not included. So um, I guess the big question is what is actually um, going to happen? And I will say that um, at this point, your guess is as good as mine. Um, like I said at the beginning, I think it's probably a safe bet that, that, that something gets passed, but I think there's a very small chance that it's going to look exactly like um, what passed Congress. And so hopefully, you know, some of the good things that we talked about um, in, in this session can, can happen without necessarily all, all, all of the bad pieces. So um, if anyone has any more comments or any questions, happy to, happy to entertain those. Um, and if not, I will say thanks again to everybody for attending today. Um, really appreciate it. Um, hope you enjoy the um, hope you enjoy this this weekend. And um, consider this extra ten minutes my uh, my Christmas present for me to you. Thanks all.